since we're recording up here, we press it again. The title of this little message is The Unmarred Expression of Christ. Let's begin with a short word of prayer. Father God, thank you for the, this text, this simple good teaching to us from Peter. I pray that you will use the truth of these words by the power of your spirit to teach our hearts. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Has um, something like this ever happened to you? It's happened to me several times. Let's say you're with a group of friends and one of them is going through some rough times. He, he's been on edge, anxious, a bit petulant. And suddenly he says something cutting and condescending to another one of your friends. Everyone is immediately uncomfortable. Instead of the deserved response, the friend that is taking this shot from the other friend, the disgraced friend replies, replies instead with uh, compassion and tenderness. It shocks you, it shocks everybody standing there because what the guy said was truly special. It was nothing like what you expected him to say. Jesus' words, in fact, to Peter come to mind. You, you think to yourself, that response was not a flesh and blood. The Father himself just spoke through my friend. Tonight, we're going to learn how miracles like that happen. Peter's going to teach us how you may find yourself being the conduit of the unmarred expression of Jesus Christ. The text is 1 Peter 3. We're going to focus in on verses 8 and 9. Peter's teaching us in, these, in this passage how the Spirit of our Lord can transform difficulties in relationships into goodness. He has addressed the master-slave relationship, which in course instructs us on the employer-employee relationship today, and he's also talked to us about the marriage relationship, and then he turns to the last or final relationship that he mentions, and it's the one we're going to look at in verses eight and nine. This relationship, we'll see, is about us. Listen to the words of the verses. Finally, he says, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Now, who is encompassed by his phrase, all of you? That way we'll know what group he is talking to. In the very first words of this letter, Peter specifies who he means. Listen to verses one and two of chapter one. To God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. A bunch of eloquent words but what he's saying is he's writing to us, to like-minded believers. He's instructing God's children through this letter. We, brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, I want you to notice, we're back to chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, that there's a three-step progression of logic in these verses. First, Peter describes that there is a heartfelt propensity that each of us, all brothers and sisters in Christ, have. We possess this tendency in our hearts. Each of us enjoys a spirit-given inclination of heart through which we are permitted to exercise our faith. 
Secondly, he explains that eventually you're going to encounter an ugly situation. In the midst of it, you are going to be invited to address the problem in a supernatural way. And then third and finally, in his three steps of logic, Peter identifies what will be the impetus in you to respond to the problem in this supernatural way. He will identify what motivates you and I to act in a way <laughs> that others will find surprising and even strange. So we'll first examine the inclination, second, the invitation, and third, the impetus. The inclination of the redeemed heart is described here in verse eight. Since Adam, everyone, except Jesus, of course, has had the same inward disposition. Humans are in Paul's words in 2 Timothy 3, 2 and 4, lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, ungrateful, without self-control, brutal, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Even after the flood, where ju God judged the wickedness on earth at that time and the humans that were left over after the flood, God observed of them, Genesis 8, 21. Every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. But all of us who have given our lives to King Jesus become the father's adopted children. That's why we're referred to as brothers and sisters in Christ. We all have been inwardly transformed, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Behold, the old is gone and the new has come. We've been crucified with Christ. We no longer live. Christ lives in us. We have been given a new inclination of heart that Peter describes for us right here in verse 8. He says, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Before, before King Jesus, selfish and prideful was the natural thing to do. The natural way always ultimately produces strife. But now, Peter says, we don't have to be that way. The Greek words translate very literally, same-minded, feeling with, family affection, feeling far, lowly-minded. You have received from the Spirit of our Lord the inward inclination to set aside differences in favor of unity, to join in with other people's feelings, to love fellow believers like brothers and sisters, to feel for others, and to put their cares and needs above your own. In the words of Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, in our hearts, we brothers and sisters in Christ possess the very attitude of Jesus Christ. How is this inclination put into action. In a word, faith. It's activated in the same way husbands are considerate, wives are submissive, slaves are submissive. Peter tells us, 1 Peter 2.21, Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his footsteps. And what is that example? Peter tells us, verse 23, he, Jesus, entrusted himself to him, God, who judges justly. He entrusted himself to him who judges justly. That was his example. When we trust the son, like the son trusted the father, we will supernaturally exhibit the character of God. 
Our Lord described the principle in these words, John 14, 9 to 12. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. It's the Father who's living in me who's doing his work. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me in the same way I believe the Father will do the works that I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these. The Spirit provides you with the inward inclination to love others selflessly. That inclination may, it might be involved when you are nice to a nice person, but most everybody is nice to people who are nice to them. Instead, it is when you inexplicably love another person who is being hateful to you that the watching world sees Christ in you. Consequently, we are going to periodically face God-orchestrated difficult situation when loving the other person is not humanly possible, which brings us to the invitation. Notice that in each relationship type, employment, marriage, church, Peter's focus is on tensions that arise in these relationships. The slave may be, have a harsh master. A wife may have an unbelieving husband, or a husband may be excessively dominant. Now, the possible tension he identifies within the community of brothers and sisters in Christ, well, it's surprising. It's shocking. Look now at verse 9. He says, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. Peter forecasts here that there are going to be occasions of evil and insult even among God's children. <laughs> and if that wasn't startling enough, he explains that the evil or insult happens because God has allowed the situation in order to call you, to invite you, to bless. Now, let, let me repeat that. Peter is teaching us here that when you face an unfair assault by a fellow brother or sister, this is an event in which you are being called, invited by your Lord to respond in an unnatural, in an inhuman, in a supernatural way. God has handpicked you to suffer contempt. At that moment, it is as if the baseball team manager looks over to you sitting on the bench and says, get in the game, pitch us out of this jam. Now, hopefully, I've got a little hypothetical situation here that'll illustrate, I hope, why God might allow evil or insult within his church. Suppose I'm attending a small group. There are about, oh, let's say 15 of us in a, in a small group Bible study. And we're discussing what it means for husbands to be considerate. And I comment to the group that never saying anything publicly that is critical about my wife is a way that I can be considerate of her. If I have a problem, I suggest I only discuss it with her privately, not publicly in front of others. Bob, one of the other members sitting here in the group, chimes in. He looks over at me and he says, well, were you being considerate to Lucy when you were huddled at that back table at Bartlett's restaurant last week with that beautiful blonde lady? Well, my immediate visceral reaction is to retaliate at Bob. I think to myself, if you must know Bob, the lady is my wife's friend. She lost her husband about 60 days ago to a brain tumor. tumor. Lucy asked me to meet with her to help her with the family's business affairs. She works near Anderson Lane, so we agreed to meet after work at Bartlett's. 
But I don't say that. In the moment, it occurs to me that while this answer is all truth, it will communicate to everyone that I consider Bob a nosy fool. It will portray to everyone else in the group that this Bible study is just like the office or the locker room at the country club. Smackdown Bob makes Dale look good. So, with little idea of what I'm going to say, I resolve that it isn't going to be that. I find myself instead saying, thanks, Bob, for having the courage to tell me what you saw and how you perceived it. I was focused on what the lady and I had met to discuss and forgot all about what others might see. I agree with you. As believers, we have a responsibility to make sure we don't even give the appearance of wrong conduct. I should have been sensitive to that. The inclination we have for loving others more than ourselves is in our hearts. Unless difficult situations draw that out, the watching world cannot see or experience it. Peter's teaching us that in special moments, we will be given the opportunity to call on that selfless inclination within to, to behave in a way that startles the watching world. Some will be repulsed. Listen to these amazing verses. 1 Corinthians 4, 12 and 13. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. We have become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world. Yeah, that's the way most will perceive us. But there'll be others, maybe just a few, who will discover the sweet forgiveness of King Jesus when they witness the unmarred expression of his character exhibited through you. Which brings us to the impetus. The encouragement within to bless when cursed not only comes from the Spirit's inclination, it also comes from the fruit of blessing another person. Verse 9 in the NIV, we've already read it twice, let me read it again, um, says this. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing because to this you were called. That's what we've just discussed. And then the last phrase, so that you may inherit a blessing. The NIV's translation, inherit, for the Greek word that Peter uses, I believe is unfortunate. We inherit from someone who has died. Our benefactor, Jesus, died for us long ago. When he died, our inheritance became complete. We can't add to it or subtract from it. Peter's already confirmed this, 1 Peter 1, 3, and 4. He says, praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us what? An inheritance that can never perish, soil, or fade. He says, finally, this inheritance is kept, it's secure, it's intact for you in heaven. Now, the better translation in the last phrase here is the word obtain, not inheritance. The ESV and the New American Standard Bible they translate the phrase, for to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. How then do you obtain a blessing by blessing? It's one of these situations where the answer is kind of so obvious we might miss. Think of a time when you blessed 
someone who clearly didn't deserve it. Sometime later, did you receive a special, warm, private assurance that at least in some small way, you and the spirit together made an eternal difference for good? That's the blessing, a blessing. So to summarize, Peter teaches us to have confidence then when, that when we are called, we already have the character of our Lord residing within. In those moments when everyone expects you to push back against evil or insult, by faith you instead bless. And by blessing, you in turn receive the blessing of knowing that Christ chose you to be the conduit of his love expressed through you. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father God, thank you that in your great sovereignty over everything, you have made it possible for us to have uh, opportunities to contribute in the expression of your love to other people. Thank you for allowing us to play a part in your great plan. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.